All right, uh, welcome to the show, Joel. Thank you for coming on. Um, I'm really pumped you're here. We've we've known each other for a couple of years now, and um, yeah, I've I've got you on because you're the host of the podcast Lived Experience, where you talk to people about mental health and talk to people with mental health um, from a different a couple of different angles. I've been on your show, uh, so now I'm returning the favor and and bringing you on to mine, I mm-hmm. guess. Um, but yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my first question. I, I love to start with an impact question, and uh, I want to ask you: when it comes to mental health, why are you so passionate about that area, and and what are you seeing in in the space that that you know why you do what you do? So so what, what kind of led you down that path? Yeah, I sort of I was more passionate out of let's say anger or frustration, you know, growing up, you know, a bit about myself with, you know, single mother with bipolar and quite severe bipolar. And what I mean by that is like, you know, regular hospitalizations at a psychiatric ward for like, you know, three months or four months or two months, whatever it would be. And, um, you know, growing up, there was nothing, there was no real support. It was always very hidden and, you know, very embarrassed by it. I was probably embarrassed by it until probably the age of 28, 29. And, and, you know, until I sort of thought, you know, well, you know, no need to be embarrassed about it. You know, it's sort of, start talking about start opening up and i was sort of frustrated as well about with the mental health space there's so much awareness we've talked about this before but around depression and anxiety there's no mention about bipolar schizophrenia like uh, let's say borderline personality disorder and and children who have parents and all that sort of stuff there's nothing really that i've known or i've never really seen any champions off that in the in the media everyone's a champion for depression or anxiety but there's no one who champions that and if you look at the stats like there's 250 kids in victoria thousand kids in victoria who have a parent with a mental illness or a mental condition, that's 250,000 kids just in Victoria. So you take that out to the rest of Australia, you know, and like I think it's like one or two percent of the population has bipolar and, and schizophrenia is obviously a bit less, but there's there's a large area of mental health and, and stuff like that and issues that don't get any awareness or they're not, let's say, sexy to talk about. Um, so that was really more just a frustration about, like, this is, this is my experience. There's nothing much really, no one really out there talking much about it, so why not? start promoting it in some way or just sharing the story i've got nothing to hide i'm a pretty bit more mature now than what i was when i was younger and i'm not afraid of it. it's who i am and then um you know if my if my sharing or if i can create some conversations does help someone uh then it's all worth it i like what you said there i've got nothing to hide and i think that's why you and i get along um, for a number of reasons um but one of them is is we, we're both pretty open and transparent I've had conversations with people who've told, talked to me about my mental health and they've said, Tim, be careful about what you share online because, because people might judge or, or um, you know, and there is a, the, uh, look, I, I agree, there might, be, there might be an element to that and, and, you know, me being manic and on a manic rant, maybe not post that, right? Um, but when it comes to the story and the lessons and the journey, I always tell people my bipolar is actually a really good thing because the depression side of things gives me a level of insight, knowledge and lessons into myself that people don't get. The mania gives me a level of passion, motivation, energy and drive that a lot of people can't tap into. I can stay up to 2am very easily um, because of like you're always going to be on a spectrum like no matter what medication you're taking there's mm. always going to be elements of mania there's always going to be elements of depression but the authenticity of telling people that is is amazing and is that what you've discovered by having people on your show and talking um, through their stories yeah well it sort of came about I did a, I did a podcast with, with Jim who's my boss and I- and um, basically, I shared a clip on my social media. I'm pretty close on my social media. I don't have many, many, you know. Oh, sorry. I'll just cut in. So, Jim, oh, you, so you mean like Jim, so Jim Pemmon. So, you work yeah, for the, oh, sorry, Jim, yeah, Jim's, Jim's, Jim's Mowing CEO founder. Yeah, I work for him. But I did a, we did a podcast, we are talking about mental illness, and I sort of told him my story. And I, I clipped it up, and I just put it on my social media because no one really knew that about me. Like, I never, my schoolmates, you know, I never really talked about it at high school, any, any of that. You know, teachers in the background sort of knew, and I shared that online. I've got a pretty close network on my social media, but got like more than 100 and something shares. And all these comments, and I've got all these inboxes out of the blue. I'm like, oh, bloody hell, like people telling me who I had no idea about their mum had bipolar or mum had schizophrenia or thanks for doing this. And they're just telling me all this story out of the blue. Like, it's just crazy via an inbox. I'm thinking, well, you know, I might have to, you know, do something, you know, around this and try and do more of this sort of stuff. Because if people are sort of going, well, that sort of helped me know that you had that issue, you know, and they're telling me out of the blue, just like, you know, people I haven't spoken to in 10 years or, or whatever it is. And it's not, it wasn't a pity thing. It was just more like saying, hey, this stuff goes on and, 
no one really talks about it. So, you know, that, that reaction, you know, uh, said, you know, need to do more of this stuff. And I'll just say to you, Tim, if someone's being negative and saying, oh, you shouldn't share that online, like, what does it say about them? You know, we're, we're, we're at our age now. We're like 20 years ago. Yeah, maybe, or, you know, 15 years ago. For sure, I'm like, you know, my mum used to say, don't tell anyone about my condition and all that sort of stuff. Or don't tell anyone I'm sick or whatever else. But I think now, you know, we're a lot more open. We understand a bit more about it. And, you know, I wouldn't, if anyone says that to you, not to share your experience because of what people will say online, like seriously, like what does it say about that person or anyone who would uh, react negatively in that space? We should be holding those people up and saying, you know, fantastic. And that's bloody, bloody brilliant, which is why I had you on to share your uh, story because I think it's really admirable. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that you say people reacted in such a positive way. And I believe it's because people have these struggles, people have these issues, but no one does talk about it. So when finally there's someone like you or me that talks about it, they go, oh my God, that's me. I can relate to that. I've been through a dark place. I've got schizophrenia. I've got dyslexia. Mm. I've got I've got uh, bipolar. I've got all these stuff. And people can then relate to it. And that's why I think it, it went successful. For me... I've wanted to edit and clip up the podcast we did because I recently had a friend reach out to me and say, "Hey, um, you know my, uh, you know a family member of mine has just got bipolar. Can you please tell me about it?" And I, um, I then talked to him for twenty five minutes and told him about my experience. But then I said, "Hey, listen to Joel's podcast that I did." Um, he then sent me a message after, which I think I screenshot to yeah. you. Um, and that's just the power of what you do. People who, yeah, and, and tell me about, have you had more experiences like that of people like sending you screenshots of, hey, I sent this episode to? Oh, I've, had, I've had a bit of a weird experience. I've had like a few people I haven't seen in years and they have a few, few, few sherbets into them like back home or you know, at a party and they'll come up to me and tell me their story from like the last couple of years where they really struggle with depression or whatever it is. And I've had that happen quite a bit. They won't tell me when they're sober or something, but they'll tell me when they've had a few, a few beers in them. So... That makes you feel good in a way and it sort of just reinforces like, you know, just just put stuff out there, you know, be vulnerable um, and someone will get something out of it. And, you know, the way I look at it is if you do, let's say if you do 100 episodes and for and only, and you help one person in a significant way with what you're doing, that's that's all worth it in my opinion. Mm. So, um, you know, that's sort of, you know, you get occasional feedback. I'm definitely ramping it up a lot more. Now I'm trying to be consistent. I'm not consistent. So every couple of weeks is, is the goal and, and try and see. But it's definitely not, I'm not doing it for any sort of, uh, you know, let's say glorification or ego. I'm just basically doing it because there's no, as I said before, there's not. There's a lot of podcasts around depression and anxiety. There's not much in regards to children who have parents with serious issues or bipolar or schizophrenia that I've seen. There's some stuff, but there's not. There's not to the extent of the other broader topics. Mm. So let's get into the bipolar and the schizophrenia and um, talk about the the stuff you've you've learnt with um, you know caring for your mum and. For you growing up, let's let's just kind of wind back. Um, what was what was the perception like growing up, and then what would have you liked it to be? Um, you know, maybe where it is now in terms of that difference, um, because we talk about like it wasn't talked about twenty years ago. Sort yeah, of. no, look, it's it's very prevalent, like you know, but it was never talked about. And um, yeah, look, growing up, it was a bit. I still I didn't really understand what was going on at all. You know, it took. I didn't really understand for a long, long time. You sort of just that's your that's your environment, and that's all you know. So you don't know, you know, because she was a single mum. You don't know having a dad or anything like that. You just know that you know every every year or two she'd be gone for three months for, you know, for mental health or what bipolar. We'd know it as, but we didn't understand what it was, and we got no explanations around it. None of that. You know, you just get basically allocated to a a social worker, and you get put into a, a foster care, and then live with friends, families, and there was no no one really ever sat you down and said, hey, this is what this condition is. And there was no sort of really real counselling. I just don't think no one knew how to deal with it. Um, how, when there's a child involved in mental health, it's very, very hard. Uh, I think even still, there's no real, there's no like procedures or processes in place where, all right, cool, this person with bipolar schizophrenia has been hospitalised, they've got two kids, we're going to put them in this sort of program every week. There's none of that, or there was none of that. So it was just sort of like, you know, that's life and figure it out for yourself. And, and people felt... Like the people we stayed with were fantastic, but they didn't know how to deal with it, and they shouldn't have to sit you down and try and counsel you and stuff like that. There was none of that. So, and that's that's sort of my experience. It was very very taboo to talk about it. The old girl was definitely embarrassed by it. So you know you wouldn't go around saying. So you just have to rock up to school and you wouldn't say much and just keep going as normal. And I get to live with my friend's family for three months. So it's pretty cool. Get to play cricket with your mates and footy, and 
that's the way I sort of looked at it. But it was just never, it was just never really touched on. It was never really dealt with properly, you know. And you learn out that if you don't deal with it mm-hmm. properly, then and there, when you get older, it all sort of, you know, it comes back. So you have to deal with it. But um, I don't know if that answers your question. But that's no, sort it of does, what it, does. it was. Yeah. And what are the lessons you've learned about yourself and and life and maybe the positive spin of what your mum's been through? What are the things that you've taken away from it and gone? That's actually the the advantage to it, or that's the lesson I've learned. Yeah, well, I sort of I didn't realize that until a bit later in life, but definitely being resilient and very adaptable. You know, you can go to school one day, you know, everything's pretty normal. The next day, you know, cops will come to the school, and you know, your old girl's in hospital, and you're in a you know back of the divvy van going to the human services offices. So you're very you learn to be very very resilient, very adaptable, uh, very independent. Um, they're probably the the three the three main things. And then um, you sort of, you try, I think I've got a pretty high level of empathy or a bit of, un, and a lot of patience as well, um, you know, and just sort of accepting your lot in life and, you know, that wasn't the normal situation, sort of trying to move on and, and get on with it. But um, a lot of people don't, you know, I, I definitely struggled with it early on when I was younger as a teenager. We all think we're sort of heroes growing up as a young a young man and you sort of, you know, you sort of act up in a bit of a way, but um, they're probably resilience in being really adaptable. And it's definitely helped me in my work life. Uh, I work with a pretty intense individual, so I'm pretty I'm pretty relaxed and, and sort of adaptable to most situations. I think. Yeah, um, let's talk about that um, adaptability and empathy. Um, mm. Have you yourself um, been through mental health struggles, or even just a down period like people go through, then being able to really understand that and be like, okay, this is the the steps forward, or um, have you then had friends, um, even like even me, like. Um, when I reached back out to you and said, "Hey, mate, I've been through a, a depression. That's why I didn't answer to you, to your messages and that kind of thing." Like you were able to understand, um, and the response that I got back from you was so much better than than some responses I've had in the past, where some people just ignore me, and that's just a nature of them not understanding yeah. what what goes on. They don't have the empathy. They don't get it. And but there's people like you and good support networks who do understand. So I guess coming back to my question, like, yeah, have you been through through some some dark periods or even just you know the low days, or have you had friends that you've been able to really help by having the empathy and, and understanding? Yeah, I've had a couple of friends who've had some serious stuff going on and just go over there and just talk to them and listen. I think with me, they know they know my experience with it. So I'm not trying to I'm not trying to lecture anyone. I've sort of been through what I've experienced. I me personally, I haven't to be honest with you, Tim. I haven't had really too many issues with it. I'm quite I'm quite aware of the uh, condition, and I'm sort of at an age now where I used to worry about it heaps. I used to worry well, I'm going to have bipolar, I'm going to have bipolar, but I'm at an age now where I know that I don't. Um, hmm. But I've, I've sort of been okay. Like I've had a few like anyone else. We have your down days and stuff like that, and. You know, how, what do you do to get out of it? And yeah, some days, you know, I definitely do feel sorry for people with clinical depression and who have bipolar and stuff when they're depressed. Like it's a pretty, pretty bad thing. But I'm sort of lucky enough not to have mm. that genetics. So I'm sort of, yeah. it's never really experienced. But in regards to my friends, yeah, I've had a had a few friends with some serious issues, and just being able to go and listen to to them, and they know that I've got experience, which I think helps a lot. You know, if you've got someone trying to talk to you about mental health who's never really had any mental mental health experience and stuff, it can be pretty hard. But um, yeah, being definitely being able to listen to them and, and come from a place of, of well-meaning. I'm sorry to hear about those people didn't get back to you. That's not good at all. But I understand, like especially with people like with depression and stuff, like, there might be six months where they just don't want to, they can't do anything, you know. And that's not their fault. That's just the way it is. Um, mm. oh, so. it is the it is the rarity. Yeah. Uh, it is the rarity that someone doesn't doesn't message back. Um, ninety nine percent of the time, people are re- are really fantastic, and I think that's the the age we live in, there's just one or two percent of people that just don't, they don't have the empathy to, to understand it. And I think that's where, that's why I wanted to get you on is, is that's where I believe you're, you're really an expert in is, is understanding this. Um, something I wanted to ask you, the relationship between, you know, parent and, and oh, child yeah. <laughs> is, is, is a big one. And I think for you, correct me if I'm wrong, but at the hit to point where, um, parent and child the relationship turns into more of a friendship and I see that with my dad at the moment um I see that with my my mum at the moment and I see that with my uncle and auntie at the moment um it it hits a point where you can talk about things um has there been that point or was that point accelerated between you and your mum 
um, because of her bipolar and, and then you, you know, 15, 16, 18, then caring and help, helping her? Oh, probably, probably not really. I was a little, a little bit different. Like my mum's condition is pretty, pretty full on. So it's sort mm. of, it was. It's definitely never really. It's always been a mother child thing. It's never been like a, a friends. You know, you know, I'm still like a six year old boy to her. You know, I always will be. And, you know, I sort of look like my old man. So she dotes on me a lot more than what my younger sister. So, but it's um, it never really. It's always been like a mother child. But at the end of the day, like I have been. She's always viewed me as an as a young man from like you know eight ten years old. You know, I'm there making financial decisions or come with me to the atm so i don't get you know whatever and all this sort of stuff so i've always been treated a lot a lot different it's never been a parent child it's always been i don't know what you would call it but um we haven't it's it's very hard to have a a friendship with her just because of how um intense her condition is you know and i'm always sort of like a six-year-old in her eyes yeah. like most mums to kids so well, that's I'd, I'd have to, i have to say it hasn't been my experience so i know your experience with your dad's probably a lot different whereas with my mum it's definitely a parent child sort of thing and unfortunately the old girl's in a nursing home now, she's just got early onset dementia, so mm. that's sort of kicking in now. So it's sort of you know a bit more, a bit more of a changed relationship in what's happening at the moment. So yeah. So has that meant you've had to grow up a lot faster? Do you oh reckon, yeah. Than some? Yeah. Look, the, the way I, the way I sort of describe it is, I think with anyone who's got a um a parent with a serious mental health condition, there comes an age when it, being your childhood where there's a, a moment where you you switch and you go, okay, this it's not normal what we've got and we're different to other people. So for me, that was probably around age of seven when I had a couple of cops come to the class and, and sort of go, hey, can we see? Like, can we see Joel? And I'm like, in year seven, I'm thinking, what's going on? Like, it's good for my reputation in school and stuff with the, with the girls or whatever. But you go, and what's going on? And you get taken out. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're in the back of a divvy van going to the human services office. And before that, I thought our life was normal. Like, I didn't really have much recollection of, you know, you go to school and you have, you know, Christmases and stuff like that. And then after that, you sort of go, oh, what's going on here? And then you become more aware. So there's almost like a moment of awareness in your childhood where you go, right, my parent is not, let's say, normal. Well, they are, but they're normal to you, but they're not, you know, not normal in the schemes of things. And you become aware and then everything from then on is a bit different is how I look at it. Mm-hmm. And and that difference um, really, like like what are those, those when do you have a recognition of that? And do you look back on that and go like, uh, this might be a hard question, but and and maybe a little bit. But do do you kind of wish it was you were like John or Rob or you know who? Oh, of course, didn't absolutely. Have these? Oh, yeah. absolutely. You know, like I sort of view it like my childhood ended at seven because after then I was aware of going. I had I was sort of oblivious to the fact, you know, you might be two months at a mate's house, you just got no idea what's going on, and then you sort of become a bit more aware and mature. And then after that, you know, you sort of it's sort of lost a lot of a bit of the gleams lost in your you know moving forward and. It's something you just sort of learn to live with. And the problem the problem with it back then is you never had anything really explained to you. You know, you'd be sat in a human services office or whatever it is and and they just wouldn't explain they talk down to you all the time. And that's what I found really annoying. Like, you know, you're seven, eight years old and you might be a kid. Like even at the age of sixteen, like when she was getting treated in the country and stuff, like the psychologists or the psychiatrists, they wouldn't even really acknowledge your existence, your feelings, your thoughts or your reactions to what they want to do for a treatment. You know, you have to get your grandmother to sort of push your case on your behalf. They still didn't, they didn't feel they respected us and they sort of just treat the patient. They don't treat the, hey, they've got young kids or they've got a teenage kid or whatever it is and they don't they don't involve you at all in the process. And I think that's really wrong with the uh, the psychiatric profession and psychologists is they don't, you're my patient and that's it. They don't, understand, they, don't, they don't care about that and that's not their job. And I know that's changing a bit now apparently, but I still think that's a, that's a, big, uh, a big gap in what they do. So have you had meetings or do you want to in the future have meetings with the decision makers that make those decisions and, and what would you say to them, like if they're trying to change, if they've gone, oh, we realise that we need to get the, the kid involved more, what do you want them to do and, and basically, you know, let's, let's use this as a platform, what's, what's the message that you want them to, to say and do and, and then, mate, if we can use this content to, to get you a meeting sure. with them, let's, let's do it. Well, I read the recent, obviously, you know, the Royal, the Royal Commission recently on mental health come out and they, for the first time in, I've read, they've actually acknowledged about the child involved in it and actually had things in place for the child. I hope they go ahead, but I, I never did a submission. I was told to do a submission and stuff. I just never did it. Like I was pretty emotional when I read the the findings where they have finally acknowledged the kid or the children in in, in if, where there's a challenges involved when there's a parent with a mental illness. So it's sort of finally been recognised. But what I would say to them is this: when you're when you're a kid growing up in a, on a you know if your mother or father's got schizophrenia bipolar, you're exposed to a lot of stuff from a very early age, 
a lot of uh, intense moments, you know, that could be could be unwell, all this sort of stuff. So you know what's going on, you know, and people, if just because someone's six years old or seven years old or eight years old, it doesn't mean they know not know what's going on. They're not affected by those actions. They're not just oblivious to it. So I would say treat anyone, treat any kid as a, you know, don't talk down to them, be empathetic, explain what's going on, and treat them almost, I'm not saying treat them like an adult, but you should explain these concepts to them of what's going on so they can then understand, they can then manage their emotions better and things like that. And and basically, and also, you'd want some sort of mentorship program going on. I know there's some things going on in Victoria, but like, what would it help me a world of good? And there's a foundation in Victoria called Satellite Foundation. This is what they do is they run camps and workshops for kids who have parents with schizophrenia, bipolar and, and BPD and these things. And they take these kids away from regional areas or from the city for like a weekend workshop. And that's when they do arts and they talk about their feelings and stuff. But everyone there is in the same boat. And that's what would have helped me because at the time I had no one in the same boat and you sort of think you're all alone in the world and things like that. That's why when you do content like this, it resonates with people because they don't hear, they think, oh, I had that as well. That's why the content you do around this stuff resonates with a lot is because it's great to hear someone finally just talking about because everyone thinks they're so alone when statistically they're not. You know, 250,000 kids in Victoria have a parent with a mental con- with the, some sort of mental condition. So it's a very prevalent issue, but it's something you won't see a lot of stuff talked about. So I would just say, treat the kid with respectfully treat him let him know fully what's going on from from as early as age as possible they can definitely understand it because they're in intense environments anyway so that's the way to go and also try and some sort of you know support by the way let's say like every month they get together with other kids or they have they, they're made to feel like someone cares for them because i didn't find that a lot growing up you know you sort of just in the system and away you go and you are getting cared for physically like for his food and, and shelter and stuff but there's no sort of you know psychological counseling or none of that sort of stuff which goes on and i think you got to treat it there because if you don't what happens is a lot of kids in my situation they've done studies on it they're more inclined to go to jail drug problems don't do any further education which is they don't do anything they it's they use it as an as a as a as an excuse to not do anything in life and the studies have shown that to be the case as well so governments you will save money if you help these people then because you're more going to have more productive uh, people in society so mm. yeah i hope that answers your question oh it definitely does it definitely yeah. does um and the the thing about um, the thing about this that I'm I'm interested to know is uh, on a personal note, um, you know I'm <laughs> I'm in a, a good relationship. We've been talking about future. It's definitely a long way away. Um, but you know I know eventually you know I want to have kids, and and you're probably the same. You you probably want to have kids as well. As someone with bipolar. Um, how do I? How do me as a as a future father down the line? How how do I, what advice would you give to me or someone else out there who's a parent with depression, bipolar, schizophrenia? What do you do? How do you communicate that to to your son, daughter, or, or child? Great question. There's actually a lot of good books, children's books you can get from like Fat Me and from Cop Me and from like Satellite and stuff, which actually have. Mm-hmm have children's book and explains the condition and has it for adults and kids. It's actually a really good book. But I would just say explain it as early as you can. You know, you're still their parent. You're going to love them the same as everyone else, but you might just have, you might some sometimes you might just have a, you know, different different sort of behavior and just explain them, keep them involved and let them know as early as possible what's going on. And just because kids are young, they can understand what's going on. So you can, you, they can take quite complex concepts, I think, from an early age. So I would say just, you know, you're going to be a parent, you're going to love them as, as normal, but just try and, maybe some resources and education from a very early age about, about the condition is all you really want to know and explain it to them and it doesn't change anything. Just occasionally this is what happens to mum or, to mum or dad and, and this is the way it is, but this is just so you understand and that's it. Just just yeah. an explanation, just some understanding. Yeah. Keeping in the loop would be the way to go, I'd reckon. No, definitely. Um, and it's almost like this, my very first date that I had with my partner, I, I looked at her, I said, I've got bipolar. I told her straight up. Um, and I would do that on other dates that I was on as well. Um, just because telling someone up front is the best thing you can do. Um, so it's the same principle with, with your kids. Just tell them. Absolutely. You know, and then kids can understand quite... Com- I don't know. Some, they can understand quite complex things. You know, they can use an iPad at four or five and do a lot of things, which, you know, so they can they can understand quite complex things, I would say. So just, just keep them in the loop and mm-hmm. explain it to them. And then education is the best thing for them. And, Nothing changes from that perspective, I reckon. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, I want to call this section 
of the podcast pitch my product, pitch my service, pitch my podcast, pitch my, my thing. Um, because if you've been listening to Joel for 24 minutes now, you like what he's saying. So I'm going to give you your time. To, so let's get some more listeners to your show because I think that's, um, that's the powerful thing. Um, tell me, apart from my interview, um, tell me about your podcast and then tell me an interview that you've done that, that really was a, a wow moment for you. Yeah, well, I've done a, I've done a couple. Like, I had a um a guy I went to school with called Simon Hogan. He used to play for Geelong, and he um recently just came out of his bipolar. He retired from the AFL due to depression, but you know, we we, we talked around for two hours and went pretty in depth into um. I think he just got out of actually treatment or hospital like four weeks prior to doing my interviews. So he's still he's still getting his senses back a bit. But it was really honest conversation around bipolar and and sort of what goes on and the misconceptions still like an elite sporting club around mental health and. Probably the other one was Brad McEwen. So Brad McEwen used to host Sports Sports Tonight. He always had that banner with Sandra Sully. He was um he was fantastic. So he's an ambassador for this foundation called Satellite and and he had an early experience with mental health, but he went on to achieve some great success. So I love those stories. So the, the sort of the angle of the podcast is more, you know, interviewing people who have had experiences of this that gone on to do good things, or will be you know, around people who who have got, you know, illnesses and stuff and want to share their stories or experiences with it. So they're probably the two that I that I really like. It's it's a long form interview. I try not make it long. I'd like to keep I'd love to keep it under forty minutes, but I can't. Some of no. them go for like two hours, hour forty and things like that. So um but it's definitely got a lot of cool open content and it's stuff that I think is uh, quite unique in regards to the stuff that people uh, have been telling me. So mm. I'm trying to be consistent, I need to be like you, you know, but every couple of weeks uh, I would just subscribe because when an episode does come, it definitely is got yeah. a lot of good info in it. I will um, leave the links to that podcast in the show notes below. So, Thank you. yeah, I'm very powerful. Um, and the last question I just want to um, call get to know get to know Joel. Um, when you're not doing your podcast, um, yeah, what do you? So let's have a quick chat about your work, and then also what do you do as a as a hobby when you're not working too? Sure. I work a lot. Um, I work too much. I work at Jim's group, which is like Jim's mowing, Jim's cleaning, Jim's everything. So I work pretty close with Jim. I've been there for around 10 years. So I head up all our digital content, our video, website, social media, PR. There'll be a lot of PR stuff coming out this week about it. But um, I've been there for a long time. I love I love what I do. My passion is my work. So it's been fantastic. Um, in my spare time, I play a lot of guitar, actually. So I've got a lot of guitars oh, behind me. But that's, um, that was, that's one tip I've got to anyone who's got a parent with a mental health condition is basically take up something... I threw myself in a sport of music. So for me, it was great because I was always away from home. I didn't want to be at home. So I was always at training or I was playing guitar. If I was practicing guitar, I got left alone. So I play a lot of guitar and also I gym a little bit, eat, you know, got a got a little shih tzu, which takes up a lot of the time as well for <laughs> misses. So they're, they're sort of, that's where my days are at the moment. Yeah. Are you more, I see that's an electric guitar. So are you more electric or acoustic? I've got, or? I've got electric and acoustic. So I'm a bit of a, a bit of an all-rounder. So Yeah. Is that a maiden? That's a Cole Clark, actually. Cole Clark. Ah, yeah, they, so. the, the, they moved from Mayton. They, they, they were in Mayton. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, yeah, they, they start. Yeah, they started their own one in Melbourne. So I was pretty yeah. lucky. I used to work at a... I used to teach guitar at a music stop in the, shop in the country. So I used to get that Cole yep. Clark for really cheap back in the day. But yeah, it used ah, to be um, part of the maintenance. But it's a nice thing. So I'm a bit of an all-rounder, like everything. Yeah. I've got a Mayton guitar. Um, geez, where is it? It's probably in the other room. Um, but yeah, for me, that's been a great... Thing if I'm I'm in a down place mm. if I get out the guitar play some Jack Johnson, you know it's just uh, just some good stuff. I'm learning an instrument for anyone's like fan fantastic. I was sort of lucky, you know, like I you know I had a guitar in my hand from a really young age and I sort of worked out like I was you know I practiced a lot and you get results and it's good for confidence as well, self esteem and stuff. And that can be applied for everything, whether it be art or sport or whatever it is. You know, sort of if you are a child in that sort of situation, you want to throw yourself into those things because it definitely helps with your self esteem, which can definitely take a hit. Mm. Yeah. What is it that you love the most about what you do, and um, yeah, what, why do you keep doing it? In regards to work, or in regards to the probably podcast work. Or... Let's let's say but let's say both. So podcast and then and then work. You quickly, yeah, do do both. Yeah. Cool. So my work, you know, I get to work with the one of Australia's most well-known entrepreneurs, and um, you know, he's very, he's a very, he's been very good to me. Uh, he's very demanding of me. But uh, it's, I mean, I'll look back at it in 15 years and go, yeah, what a what a good experience that was. And I'm sure of IRL's osmosis, I'm learning a lot of things. You know, you're some of the five people you hang around most, and he's one of them. Mm. So, which people might think that's a good or a bad thing, but oh, it's a good thing. It's, it's a, a very good thing. thing. Yeah. Yep. So I'm sort of you know picking up a lot of them. But um, in regards to the podcast, you know, look, 
I do this a part a large part of my job at work is to interview a lot of other people. So I love I love hearing stories and hearing how how they're doing. I think, you know, everyone else is a lot more interesting than myself, so I'm always learning stuff. But in regards to the podcast, it's sort of just been good to get put some stuff out there which is a bit different uh, that can actually help someone just to know, hey, we're not alone, you know, and, and it's just it's just it's just good to, to um, have some sort of really, you know, impact in some sort of little way and looking forward to ramping it up uh, in the coming months and then trying to be consistent like yourself and take a bit of advice on what you're doing and watching what you're doing and applying yeah. it to my own thing. And if you can help one or two people, as I said, uh, that's that's the main. I think it's what anyone should do with any content you put out there. If you can help one or two people in some sort of way, you know, if it takes a lot of effort to do it, but, you know, that, it's worth it in itself. So just hopefully some young people or some sort of teenagers or young adults who maybe have a similar situation to me can sort of go cool you know that's okay there's a lot of other people like this you know i can just go and forward some success and not, not use it as an excuse it's probably the main thing yeah and um do you have a quote that you really have resonated with before you've seen it you um uh, it, it means something you, you look at that and go yeah that makes sense um you almost probably did a canva quote of it and would have put it up on Instagram. Um, so, so do you have anything um, like that, that that sticks out? Um, there's probably two. The more recent one that I use for myself um, is uh, I probably use it, be mad at the illness, not at the person. So I find myself with my mum's deteriorating condition, especially mentally. Um, you might get, I might get 20 calls a day or 15 voicemails in a day, calls at 4am and stuff, you know, and it's... <laughs> I sort of, you know, your initial reaction is very angry, but I try and sort of tell myself, be mad at the illness, not the person. I sort of level myself off a bit when that is. And um, I think just think with kids or people who have situations where they can use it as an excuse, you know, the, playing the victim might get you anywhere. It sounds very simple, um, but I think that's really apt, especially to my situation. I sort of, a light bulb one moment went off in my early 20s and I sort of, sort of not played the victim a bit and used my circumstances to crutch and sort of things started happening for me after I stopped doing that. So that's sort of the two sort of main ones I can I can give you. Yeah, definitely. Well, Joel, thank you for coming on the show. Um, how do people reach out to you if they want to reach out, if they've resonated with what you're saying, if they've got a parent with mental health, if, sure. if they're going through mental health, how, do, how does someone reach you and what's the best platform? To talk yeah, about? I'm sort of all over Google. So just punch my name, Joel Kleber. Um, you'll, you'll find various avenues to get to me. The podcast will be rebranded, The Lived Experience. I'm going through it at the moment. So The Lived Experience, um, it's got a blue and like pink cover. It's pretty pretty striking. So just subscribe to that. But yeah, anyone can just punch in Joel Kleber, my social channels there. Feel free to reach out. Uh, if you want to ask anything or if I can, if you think I can help you in any way, I'm happy to help. Awesome. Well, Joel, thank you for coming on the show. I've been Tim, you've been Joel, and uh, we've been talking, even though that's not the, the brand of my show anymore. I'm going <laughs> to keep that sign off. For sure. um, thanks. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me. Cheers.